All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining. There's like quite a few on Zoom. This is like, I think the, the most attendance I've had on digital versus in, in real. It's like, it's the, it's the opposite is what I'm trying to say. Um, anyway, so today's about a survey of VR experiences. I asked Bill to do this um, because I'm going through an exercise thanks to some initiatives we're doing in terms of uh, <coughs> sorting out and getting ahead of all of this virtual reality that's unfolding kind of before all of us. And uh, it's, ex and it's a really exciting time and still somewhat the beginning of enterprise level virtual reality. But uh, hopefully today um, I can kind of show you some new things and, and then also maybe collect some ideas from you too as I go along. So I'm gonna do a little advertising to start with. Um, on the, uh, today's the 23rd, we're doing this, this, and then the 30th, we're gonna be talking about the VR architectural review. So my colleague, Jeff Rogers is gonna be here for that. Um, I'm gonna to touch a little bit on one of his, his uh, subject matters today with a construction class that we recently helped last uh, December. And then um, there are quite a few other Franklin Hall talks happening in this room. Um, for the spring semester. And then we have a bonus now. We have this thing called VR Expeditions we're gonna be holding on Mondays. Um, the next one is gonna be on the 28th uh, for Cultural Heritage hosted by uh, Tassie Gennady. And there's gonna be a lot more hands-on next, next Monday, yeah, in headsets. So th those, those are things you wanna to come to to actually put headsets on and demo things and, and spend some time um, getting some first-hand account with these different applications. Um, I'll be back to um, show creative tools in, in uh, in VR, things like Tilt Brush and uh, Mind Show, things like that. Uh, and then also some more advertisements for the uh, Wells Library Scholars Commons talk. So this is a digital humanities and creative activities workshop series that we've been doing, probably the longest series in this modern series of workshops we've been doing. Um, so the 31st, there is a, actually no, the 24th. So that's, wait, what's today? <laughs> 23rd. 23rd, so that's tomorrow, yeah. So tomorrow in Wells uh, Library, uh, Tassie and David will be covering uh, topic modeling. So, and then I'll be back to talk about VR and AR for the digital humanities uh, later on. Okay, so the presentation outline today is gonna be mostly about, like I said, sort of this unfolding industry that's happening and, and how can IU kind of get out ahead of that in terms of like surveying what's there right now. Maybe there are things that I don't know about yet. I'm excited to hear if you have other, other things you know about for the people that are on the chat or in the room later on. Um, and then, you know, we, as the lab, we sort of act like evaluators or analysts. Um, we try to make sure that, you know, only good stuff, quote unquote, kind of makes it out there to be recommended to faculty for use in pedagogy and uh, classroom activities or, or student work. Um, and then there's, uh, there's a lot of academia um, studies on like the value of experiential technology like virtual reality in the classroom. So I'm gonna point your attention to a paper from Educause um, where they had 11 higher, in, higher education institutions working together to sort of outline the campus of the future in terms of you know, 3D technology and experiential technology. Uh, we'll cover some, uh, some applications available to you right now from these stations that are in this room um, ones that are available in the AVL, and then uh, we'll start talking about how I surveyed sort of IU and, and sort of how all this can fit within IU's teaching domains. Um, and then things to look for in the future, because this is always changing. So from industry's perspective, um, one of the most alarming things that we find is just the fact that it's just so biased towards entertainment. And the only reason it's like alarming is because, you know, I'm coming at it from an educator's perspective. Um, and education really in this um, representative chart from uh, Statista, where they kind of outlay a projection of VR and AR applications, but it is pretty accurate to represent what is available right now. And five, less than 5% is actually educational related content that's, uh, that's out there. And I, I would say that's definitely representative now. I've never surveyed exactly everything that's available, but it's very small. So this green, this whole area here is mostly broken up into different types of entertainment like video games and films, live events. And some of those actually do interplay with education a little bit, especially live events. Um, yeah, so we can actually do uh, virtual reality streaming. It's pretty interesting that that's possible nowadays. Um, and then there's a lot of enterprise. So the rest of this blue area also interplays with education because um, there are folks 
that come to school and want us to be kind of the latest and greatest high tech people in their, their business, in their industry, whatever they're studying, their domain. And these industries are starting to adopt virtual and augmented reality tools. And they want to know those tools, right? They want to go out and get a job and work in that area. So um, this paper I was talking about, it's from Educause. It's called Learning in Three Dimensions, the report on Educause, uh, Hewitt Packard, the Campus of the Future Project, which is, it's somewhat biased because HP is involved, right? But what they did was essentially they, they gave the, the tools, the the 3D workstations, VR headsets, AR um, applications and headsets, 3D scanners and 3D printers. So it's not all about virtual reality in terms of the project. But if you read this paper, you'll find that they have a very positive set of key <coughs> findings. And this is from 11 higher, ed higher education institutions, including MIT, Harvard, Yale. Um, unfortunately, Indiana University wasn't in the list. So <laughs> maybe next time Educause does this, we can uh, get involved. So then... Uh, a theme across, you know, these different um, efforts with, across these eight, or, I'm sorry, 11 campuses was that 3D technology can just make things, uh, make the invisible visible and the inaccessible accessible. And then some highlights that were mentioned in the paper is that XR technology, when I say XR, I'm, I'm encompassing the range of experiential technologies that are out there, you know, virtual reality, augmented reality, the rest of the, the uh, alphabet soup in terms of these related technologies that are having to do with visualizing 3D graphics in our spatial world. Um, they give users virtual superpowers. So that's the cool factor. You know, that's what attracts people almost initially, Eric, is this cool factor, which is not necessarily the end of the story because a lot of times you do have to dig in and figure out what exactly is this application offering me that I can't just do on a keyboard and mouse on the screen. And then XR technologies also sort of enable active and experiential learning. So Dewey defined experiential learning. You can search it, study it, write papers about it. Um, and experiential technology directly can interplay with the concepts involved with active and experiential learning. Um, and then uh, it takes a long time for 3D technology to be kind of realized on, a, on these campuses. So of the 11 campuses, you know, a lot of this stuff made a foothold in very specific departments and didn't necessarily go widespread like some futurists might predict. So even here at IU, we see it just slowly sort of matriculating out and being coming useful for certain groups. So here at the uh, Franklin Hall 052 Reality Lab, we can kind of see reality stations here, but across uh, eight, IU's eight campuses, we have um, actually five campuses with uh, reality labs or pilot reality stations located. And what these are, are essentially uh, workstations that are kind of like a nice gaming computer, but does, doesn't necessarily need to cost a whole heck of a lot. Just kind of about the same cost of as a regular workstation with a VR headset attached and sort of an enterprise configuration of software so that, you know, the VR applications launch as soon as you log in with your IU credentials and you can get access to a range of free and paid VR apps right away just by logging into the system. Um, there's a 4K monitor attached, but other than that, those are just regular computer stations that, you know, don't have to cost a whole heck of a lot more. And that's what's changed the game is the cost of this hardware. So I won't belabor too much in hardware. Let's talk a little bit more about applications. We don't have enough time for me to open every single one of these, but I'll, I'll hit on some highlights. So this list here re is representative of all of the freely available, what I would say, quote unquote, good applications that we like to show folks that have sort of broad reach in terms of the, how applicable they are to be used in class for exploration, for uh, just general understanding of what the heck VR is and how it's useful. So Google Earth VR is nice because it actually streams data from the internet down to your VR headset, just like you would with Google Earth on a smartphone or anything, but you're exploring in an experiential way. It's stereoscopic, you can fly, the interface allows you to spin the earth like a globe. It's, uh, <laughs> it's pretty broad reaching, I've had a, uh, prehistory class, an anthropology class, use it in class. I've had um, students that do photogrammetry work use it to uh, 3D scan <laughs> Google's 3D data out and you know, kind of reverse engineer Google's data. So those were informatics folks doing that. The body VR is kind of self-explanatory. It's like a journey as a, as a miniature inside of a cell or through the circulatory system. I'll, I'll skip down on the list. Uh, st Strata in Studio VR is one my students in informatics last night showed me. Um, I can't believe I didn't even know this existed, but it's a 
viewer for collada files. So if you work with 3D files, you can essentially convert your stuff to a collada file pretty, pretty easily as long as it's a polygonal file and, and view it in an HTC Vive quickly. So this is something freely available on Steam that we use. Um, and by the way, Steam is like kind of like iTunes for video games, if you didn't know already. Um, a lot of students have Steam already for just regular uh, video gameplay. And all of these are things you can download and play yourself. Uh, YouTube VR is a broad reach. I'm going to talk about that a lot more later um, because you're literally just streaming 360 videos to, to, your, to your headset. CalcFlow, that one is... Uh, Interesting. I wish I had CalcFlow when I was a, a student in calculus class because it renders an output from equations that have to do with topological data or 3D data that um, can be rendered as a 3D shape. So therefore, you can kind of prod and poke the <laughs> algorithm and change values and watch the 3D visualization change on an output. So if you're a visual learner, it's quite the it's quite the tool. Um, Vintage VR is a, an app after my own heart. <laughs> this group took a bunch of old stereoscopic um, things you would find in an antique shop that just old uh, stereoscope pictures and they 3D, or not 3D scan, they just 2D scan them and put them into this app. So then you can essentially just wear an old stereoscope in your VR headset and look at these old images. It's just sort of a, I don't know, a rundown memory lane on the fact that stereoscopic entertainment has been around for a long time. Soundstage is pretty neat. It's a, there's a photo here on the screen of a person in soundstage. This is now open source, by the way, so any musicians in electronic music can actually download this off of GitHub and compile and use it or just extend it for, for some new use. Um, but it's essentially like a way to create loops and beats and you can have like kind of free reign with how many uh, digital effects processors you use, keyboards, um, you can input your own uh, files into it. And it's just, it's for creating electronic music. All right, so in the advanced visualization lab, we have um, a lot of uh, paid applications that we would consider good, quote unquote, that are uh, available on our stations. And uh, Tiltbrush is one of the first ones I like to show folks. Um, Tiltbrush is a painting application made by Google that costs about $30. By the way, on this slide, you'll see there's a uh, parentheses around the price, the general price of these. So if you wanted to purchase these on your own and own it yourself or require students to uh, purchase that, you know, they're not that heavily priced. Um, some of these are less than $10. The uh, Titanic VR experience is really well done. They've, they've taken all the data they know about from the wreck of the Titanic and they let you go on an expedition on a submarine and actually voyage through the wreck and, and look at the, the history around that. Um, 3D Organon is one we've added recently. It's more of a pricey app, but it's uh, a pretty comprehensive anatomy viewer. So you can go to the different types of human anatomy, uh, the muscles, muscular, muscle system, the uh, neurological system, the uh, circulatory system, um, all these layers that you would typically find in like an anatomy book and see them in 3D, um, put your head inside of them if you want to, um, and then measure different parts of it, pull out individual parts of it. And as you pull out parts of it, it will automatically tag a name to the, uh, the part that you just pulled out, the, very, the, the scientific name. So... It's like I said, it's pretty comprehensive. For $60, it should be. I mean, most VR apps don't cost that much. So um, Hindenburg VR is sort of an older app, but it's still hanging around. It's a historical recreation of the Hindenburg disaster. Um, we have video players for 360 video if you want to play off of a hard drive. Those are sort of like uh, just tools, not necessarily any experience per se. Uh, some games, Job Simulator, Fantastic Contraption, and then Gravity Sketch here is another uh, sketching tool. So I'll be talking about Gravity Sketch along with Tilt Brush. Um, and another one that's free called Google Blocks where you can actually like build content in VR. And what's great about these tools is like, you can upload the content out to the web and share it back to someone else in another VR headset and work together. So, so across I use um, different domains. I went ahead and, uh, oh, let me get to that next. So <laughs> since we're talking about applications today, um, in our lab, we define three different specific types of applications. There's, um, today I'm only talking about type one and two. So type one is the sort of the easiest way to get started in using uh, virtual reality. So you're gonna find applications that are already created for you and you're, they already have data you know, implemented inside and, and useful and you don't have to really do much other than just put the headset on and, and operate the, the software and do what you need to do. Um, like Google Earth VR would be an, an excellent example of a type one. 
a type two is more like a viewer software. So something that is um, implemented by somebody else. So the application's already made, but then you bring your data to the party so that you actually have the ability to see your data in VR. And these enterprise uh, publishers like Autodesk, I'm gonna talk about later, they're starting to make type twos. So that's kind of exciting to see. Also Adobe, same, same kind of a big publisher looking at making these data viewers that you can use VR headsets with. And then type threes, I'm not gonna talk about today, but this is what people a lot of times typically think they have to do, which is build the application themselves and bring their own data to the party. And essentially, you know, build things from the ground up and engineer things. And if you can avoid that, please do. It's, it's, there's a lot of things out there that you can probably make use of that don't require a ton of extra time and money to, uh, to create. And we've been doing type threes for years and it's nice now to see a lot of type ones and twos around. Um, all right, so what I did was sort of this exhaustive review that I'm still going, kind of going at and working at it. So I've got a spreadsheet up here that I'm not gonna go through, but you can kind of get an idea of what I'm looking at here, where I have the schools of, across IUB and IU, um, IUPUI broke out into tabs, and I'm matching VR uh, applications to the best of my knowledge to these, uh, these majors. So these are all teaching domains, but they're also majors that you can earn a degree in. Um, I've identified 380 across IU Bloomington and IUPUI. Um, and then from so far, my first few passes at this, I've identified 153 VR applications that found an indirect applicability to a, a domain at IU. And 40 of them had a direct applicability to the domain, okay? Now, there's some considerations. There's a lot of these that are repeated. Like Google Earth VR is applicable to quite a few, you know? I'm not talking like 100, but like, you know, 20 probably. Um, I'm not an expert, of course, of each domain. A lot, quite a few of them I had to Google to even see what they, what they were, what the study was. And then from that limited knowledge, try to figure out and cherry pick which apps may be applicable. And then my survey just continues to be ongoing. I'm working with Elizabeth Prout in Indianapolis from the AVL, and uh, she's more into publication. So these are more like type three implementations of virtual reality, you know, papers that were written of, you know, we saw this problem, we did this type of application to solve the problem, and here's how we did it, you know, and maybe our code's available on GitHub. That happens quite a bit in the VR industry in terms of research. So um, she's identifying publications that we can match to these different domains, and then I'm identifying the type ones and twos that, that fit in. And um, yeah, there's some broad reaching applications, like I mentioned, like Google Earth. So I'll talk about that next. Uh, I'll do some videos coming soon, yeah. Go bigger. Let me see if I can just scale up. I am going to leave uh, PowerPoint with this slide. I think I can actually minimize all this stuff up here. Thanks. Yeah, so YouTube VR is one of these these applications where I'm not, I'm not a huge fan because... Um, what you're essentially doing with YouTube VR is you're not experiencing interactive content. You're just finding a 360 video to view in a headset or maybe on a smartphone. And it gives you a perspective of maybe some recording that was happening in a three, 360 degrees. So it's not, I'm not a huge fan of that as virtual reality, but in terms of me talking to faculty members, I find that this is like, kind of the most applicable right away because of the fact there's so much content on YouTube. So um, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. So I met with a, uh, a faculty member from uh, criminal, let's see, with the, she was working, working with the CTL and she was studying criminal justice or teaching criminal justice and forensics and sort of the, in the law school. So she was like, what's applicable? And I'm looking for VR apps for ahead of the meeting and not finding too much. And then I thought, oh yeah, there might be some stuff on YouTube. What if I just search for 360 criminal justice? And like quite a few, quite a few things came up. Um, not in that search. Let me see if I can find what I found for her that she's actually gonna use in class. So she wanted to show her students what it actually looks like on the inside of, uh, of a real federal prison, state prison. And there's videos of what it looks like inside of jails. And she was able to actually get this going in YouTube VR in a, her cell phone and a Google Cardboard, which is what she'll use in class. 
but she also knows that at IUPUI at the idea garden, her students could go over there and watch a higher quality and the, the, the reality stations that are in there of these videos. And uh, something else I was like really sort of alarmed by was I searched for 360 uh, African studies. And there's quite a bit out there actually. So the untold story of Africa's middle class, here we go. This is a journalistic piece made two years ago. And uh, you know, not everything is 360 that you're gonna find, but this is what I'm trying to say is as I went along meeting with faculty saying, I'm interested, show me what you got. Um, we found quite a few 360 videos that they're, they're gonna reuse. And I encourage you to you know, search for your own domain on, on YouTube 360. There might be something there that's really useful. So uh, VR tools is also something we're seeing to sprout up because what's nice is you create these, these are type twos. Um, the last one, um, YouTube is more like a type one, somebody else's data, somebody else's VR application. With tours, you can find tours that are already out there, of course, on the web using um, Google Poly or Google Expeditions. These are apps that are available to use on VR headsets. Um, they're a little trickier on the reality stations, but you can talk to us later if you, if you wanna know more. Um, but uh, from tour creator, Tassie's gonna give a talk on this coming soon. You can take 360 immersive media and put it up online and, and sort of curate your own tour through um, whatever you want. So Tassie's done this with Matt Mercer and uh, working with Google and our lab and they did a limestone tour, which will be highlighted in another talk. And uh, it's of this campus because all the buildings have you know, amazing limestone work and there's a history of the uh, the, uh, the deposit that's here in Indiana of limestone. So really an interesting tour, but now somewhat digitized, you know, not quite as good as the real version, but at least now it's distributable. So again, think really importantly that your takeaway from this slide is that you can publish your own content without having to write an app for one, but even if you're not afraid to like write code, this is hosted on Google stuff for free. Right? So it's on Google Poly for free and it's not an app that people have to download, right? So it's, it's out on the web. And that's what we're trying to get to are applications that are hosted as like web content. So sort of a future facing thing. And these are the types of tools we use to collect 360 photographs. Um, they kind of go from um, left to right is ex like less expensive to more expensive, but we're still talking, you know, the Insta360 Pro being $3,500, is that right? Yeah, less than $5,000. So it's expensive, but it's not terrible. And the Rico Theta being a few hundred dollars. And then the views in the middle, this is a system we're probably gonna phase out, but it does represent sort of the middle ground because it's I think what $800 system. Um, yeah, and there's like tons of competitors for these, these 360 cameras out there. And uh, so they're just getting better and better. And it's a nice little arms race in the photography business um, that serve virtual reality content. So Google Earth is a broad reaching example. Like I mentioned earlier, we used it in um, Alex Elvis Badillo's uh, Human Origins and Prehistory class. So Al Alex is sort of famous in our group because he's worked with me on some VR stuff, but he's also done, he's part of a, a very large photogrammetry project. So photogrammetry is another topic for another day, but it's a, it's a 3D scanning technique where you take lots of photos of 3G, 3D subject matter that overlap. And you can use, I use, um, uh, HPC resources on research desktop to actually process your photos, even from your cell phone into a 3D shape that can be viewed in a VR headset. Alex was in this project um, working with uh, Monto Aban in Mojaca, Mexico, this large um, ruin site that's a, nat a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's, you know, millions of people visit it. And uh, he, he didn't have the data ready for his class to see before, and he was worried the semester was gonna end and he was teaching this anthropology class. So he thought, why don't we all come and look at it in Google Earth VR and uh, at least we'll get that. So they did that and then luckily he finished the project and they had photogrammetrized all of Monto Bon using a drone. And then uh, they brought the students back again and saw the very high detail 3D scan that they did. So really good work by them. Um, I think it was like 15,000 photos that they took on that site. So uh, this is something that my uh, colleague Jeff Rogers sort of uh, helped along. It was our first sort of big pilot study that we were excited to support. So what you're looking at on the um, left side of the photo is the ART uh, 222 commercial construction class after their final projects were presented. And what they did was they generated um, interior designs for a monastery. So they spent a whole bunch of time in Revit, which is an Autodesk product, to just do keyboard and mouse design. And then 
they're going to incorporate ways where during the semester they can actually put headsets on and, and look at the design. Um, there's another professor on this campus that does that named John Rasick. But um, actually, I think Jeff did work with them along the way so they could actually view their stuff in VR. But what was more important, I guess, that I'd like to highlight is that they used Prospect Pro VR, which is something we buy. It's, we subscribe to it. And they were able to view their interior designs with the monks from the, from the monastery as a virtual tour collaboratively. So they were in two students in a headset with one of the monks in a headset and they could gather them to certain spots and say, this is my design and this is the way I was thinking. And they can literally kneel down and look underneath furniture and under tables and say, I sourced this product from this area. It's a really cool conversation to see people, multiple people in headsets at the same time. And I think I've got a video here of the experience they had. This was in the next lab in, uh, at IEPY. So sort of a time lapse. You still seeing it, Bill? Okay. Yeah, there's no sound anybody, so don't worry about that. But uh, you can kind of see the folks interchanging the headsets and um, taking a look and doing a presentation. Then on the other side of the room, we were live streaming their perspectives to an IQ wall so that the rest of the class could at least see what was being viewed on the headsets. Sort of bleached out with the uh, time lapse, but I guess you get the idea. Okay. So then um, moving forward kind of in the future with things, uh, we're excited to sort of investigate this next generation of even more inexpensive and high quality headsets. So these are standalone emerging solutions that are like no PC required, you know, they're a computer inside, a display inside, they have tracking systems, it's all done, it's an end-to-end -end solution. And these are three, rec three um, representations I wanna show you here. So the Oculus Go is this one down here in the bottom left. It's available now, anybody could get these over $200. And they're a limited uh, motion headset in that you, you kinda have to sit in one spot. We call it a three degrees of freedom headset, it only measures three measurements, which is roll, pitch, and yaw. And so that means you just kind of, it's a seated experience. But people are using them, and the metrics are coming out that their use is consumption. So they're watching YouTube videos and Netflix, lying down, or with friends, collaboratively. And it's this, you know, social thing happening. I mean, there's not a huge adoption rate, but it's, it's significant still because it's uh, put out by Facebook, by the way. They own the, this Oculus company. They also are bringing this out next month, the Oculus Quest. Um, this system is a six degree of freedom system that allows you to actually have motion and walk around. And then the same technology, similar technology is applied to this uh, Lenovo Mirage, which we have in the lab. Its head is tracked, the headset is tracked in three or in six degrees of freedom. You can walk around with it. Um, you don't have to stay seated, but the handset is, it has, kind of hovers with you. It's a three degrees of freedom tracker. And that's run by Google Daydream. So I, I have a couple of videos here I wanna highlight with these. You might have seen this kind of making its rounds um, on the news or I guess I'd just be on TV lately. They've been running this commercial online for Oculus um, Go in terms of Next VR, which is an app where you can watch NBA games. Are you getting any audio, Bill? That's right. You get the idea. The, uh, the idea there is you can buy a virtual ticket and go with your friends in a VR headset and watch an event. And NextVR is one company doing this where they're live streaming high quality, um, I think it's 180 per degree perspectives with red cameras out to servers that you can dial into with the headsets and um, sort of be telepresent with an avatar that it represents your friend and uh, go to a game together. So you know, athletics is interested in this here at IU. We've talked to them about that. And uh, I think uh, not Next VR, but a streaming company did come here and, and do this. This is a test pilot. So then the Quest, I have a video of, um, since it's a uh, sort of a free roaming headset, I just had this kind of funny video I wanted to show you because it's uh, Mark Zuckerberg and their Facebook CTO playing tennis. 
the reason this is um, highlighted in the talk today is just because this is a $400 headset that's um, fully capable. The, the graphics are of a pretty high quality. The, uh, the tracking systems of an extremely high quality for, for this price point. And you can see they're doing a virtual tennis game overlaid over a uh, tennis, size, tennis size area, maybe a little bit smaller than a tennis size court. So kind of interesting to think about. Oops, I keep unmuting my PC here. And then the Lenovo Mirage we have in the lab, you're welcome to come uh, check it out and test it. All right, so publish your expansion examples. So this was um, really exciting for me to see now that this is coming out in 2019. So Captivate 2019 has a VR authoring um, utility built in now that you can use to create content that lives out on the web that your students can actually access via um, a Google Cardboard or um, a few other different types of headsets like these standalones. So I'm gonna show you what this looks like in terms of publishing your own content without having to write a line of code, but just use an Adobe interface. Never thought I'd see an Adobe software have a virtual reality project preset. It's kind of cool. So again, they're working with 360 immersive media and then you're tagging traditional media on top of 360 surroundings. But it's not just a tour, you can put quizzes inside. You can put uh, different types of Captivate type things in there. Captivate has uh, a lot of features that are, that are meant for distance learning. It's not a very exciting video, sorry. Well, I guess what I'm trying to say is it's, it's sort of an, an access point. It's probably not my favorite type of VR for sure. Um, and it's not really that, you know, close to what we would consider virtual reality in terms of being like a interactive real-time environment. But what's nice here is I can give this to someone who does distance education and they can get started. Um, all right. And so a student would get a link to Adobe, they open the link and then they have a little cardboard symbol they click on and that's it. Yeah, and you can actually navigate this content with a cell phone. So it's not really VR in that case, but you know, it's some sort of wraparound content. And the subject matter of course is important. You wouldn't want to just do this for a presentation, but maybe if you're highlighting architecture or interior design or a space that you know is spatialized and it's you know hard to represent everything with just two-dimensional photos, it might be a good idea to take some 360 photos and then highlight the details um, with this authoring. So maybe an entry point for somebody, maybe just something to ignore for the rest of us. But um, you know, I don't want to be too negative about some of these some of these tools just because uh, you know, like somebody like my wife who's like not that interested in VR, but she sees me do it all the time and she just kind of rolls her eyes every time I get excited about something. I could, sh I could give this to her and she'd be like, oh yeah, I could use that for my podcast, you know, community or something. And uh, I love sharing ideas like that. Um, VRED is another tool that's it's more of enterprise, but it, it works in a lot of ways for just model viewing. It's an Autodesk product that um, you're gonna see a marketing video here where essentially you can just kind of preload any CAD kind of data. Um, folks that work in artist packages that are packages that are Autodesk also will work like Maya, Max, and these things can be brought in and viewed, viewed, and you can actually just kind of pull from a bunch of different types of like texturing and shaders to make sure things look nice. Like the, the designers of these cars didn't spend much time um, making the cars look shiny, right? They just designed the shape of the car. So VRED has some materials that you can just drag and drop on things to make things look nice, like, like rubber or metal. And, um, and that's really what the package was made for is like reviewing, you know, big design projects at like an automotive company, but this doesn't stop us from using VRED to view an art project or actually put in a design from engineering, um, for motorsports. So VRED also has some fun scripting Python things in it that I've played with where we were able to uh, do collaborative sessions where we actually put a couple people in the, 
this, this, this is situation at once in VR headsets. Collaborative isn't really that established with VR headsets in my opinion. It's just, it's there here and there, but it's not, it's not that well done yet. Yeah, they're showing quite a few uh, really whiz bang demos there, but um, the, point, the point I'm trying to make is that you can take that and, and use it in some way that's uh, just sort of viewing back your own 3D data. And then sort of moving on towards e-learning and, and distance education, either science fiction is always hypothesized, even in Ready Player One, that book and movie, that you someday could want to put on a headset and actually like come together as a class and teach your students remotely, right? Well, there are companies doing this, and I'm not trying to get on, um, you know, put engage um, this this application on some ivory tower or anything like that. But what I'm trying to say is they're they're thinking along these lines. So I wanted to show their video here as well. And what's nice here again is the publisher of the content doesn't have to be a uh, kind of 3D modeler per se. So they can they have a pub PowerPoint type interface where they can kind of drag and drop. Um, their own content and uh, sort of curate what the experience is going to be like, almost like you're setting up a planetarium for your students to experience. So there's a publishing step and then there's the actual lecture step or the, the experiential step. And this is a whole bunch of marketing fluff that I wish you could hear, but they'll show the app here pretty soon. Google Docs to share and broadcast files on virtual presenter screen. Yeah. To use Engage, simply sign up for an account and schedule a class or meeting. Choose your presentation, attach your notes and files, choose your virtual location, and invite participants and you are good to go. If somebody misses the class or presentation, why not simply record it and send it to them later using our virtual record system, which makes a virtual clone of you and the participants if needed, which can be replay later as if the event was happening live. Engage. Communicate. Teach. Learn. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yep. All right. Engage, again, is not something I'm recommending to say this is our solution, but th along these lines is what we're looking for in terms of distance education or at least an option. So like right now, we, as IU folks, can set up a Zoom meeting, right, and we can connect with our, our, uh, our fellow uh, colleagues and, and students, and we can all kind of have this video conferencing session. So the same model may exist for uh, a classroom activity where we're all wearing VR headsets, and maybe we'll be represented by avatars who knows? But the point is that if companies are looking down this road and, and it's, it's out there in some fashion, like Engage, you know, we should pay attention because eventually there will probably be a solution that we can incorporate and be ahead of and, and have here at IU because um, distance that is a priority of, of IU's mission. So, okay. Does anybody have any questions? And I'm going to open up online in case anybody has any questions. Go ahead. So you mentioned um, we had a portfolio that do not use that does not use teleto computer or they don't use base stations. Those are still relatively important thing. Is there something you would recommend for deployment on say a construction site? Yeah, I do recommend it. Uh, the reason I recommend it is because, oh, the question that Andreas asked was, uh, would I recommend using a standalone headset that doesn't require external tracking cameras like base stations that we would see on HTC Vive for like a construction site or like in your case, I think you're talking about. That's, that's not what I meant. What I meant was like, um, are there smaller options um, than the three that you proposed? Mm. You mentioned those three that don't need to be tethered, which is awesome. Right. I'm wondering like if you, if you want to work with somebody who has never used VR before and you don't want them to commit to spend $400 on a headset, right. they might not end up using it. 
Yeah, there, there is the Google Cardboard, and I didn't represent them on a slide because I think it's pretty well established out there. Uh, that, that and the Google Daydream. The Daydream's a $100 Google Cardboard flavor. Um, and Daydream is really two things. It's hardware and software. So um, the Daydream foam receiver, you have to have a cell phone to put in. So the reason I don't recommend cardboards personally is because you still have to purchase the phone. We can say people have the devices, but still, if you're going to deploy an application and show it to a lot of people, you have to assume their phones are going to work with the cardboard. And this is actually just something that's my preference. Um, we've, we've actually shown the limestone tour at the geological survey that event this year. And it was really successful. Everyone's phone was able to run it. So uh, it just depends on who your audience is. You know, if I'm working with a, a group of student, like college students, I can't even guarantee that all of them have cell phones. We would assume they would. Some of them actually don't. So kind of a, eye-opening and I realized that uh so I don't know the 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 daydream headset I haven't actually tried it's like made of fab it's made of fabric and cardboard and plastic but you just put a any google phone in it and runs everything three dot three degrees of freedom so you don't get inside out tracking but I wouldn't be surprised if we saw a cardboard that could do sort of like insight tracking like the oculus quest where you can kind of walk around because for augmented reality you know, you can do slam tracking with your phone where you can move your phone around and translate. So if you were to put that in a headset, maybe that'll come out. That's something to keep an eye out for too. Uh, yeah, so I was impressed by the Lenovo Mirage, its tracking system as well. That's another Daydream system. And the Google Daydream operating system, it's so close. It's not exactly my favorite because we can't even view our tour app that we made in it yet. Theoretically, we should because our tour app is up on Google Poly, which let me bring up for everyone. Margaret, have you used Google Poly at all? I've seen it. Seen it? Okay. The reason I like to highlight it is because over here on the left, you have sort of these search uh, categories like Tilt Brush. So you can build things in Tilt Brush, upload them to Poly and they'll be there for people to remix, like pull back down in their own tilt brush session or view just on the web with the tablet, desktop, whatever. Um, also Google Blocks, and then here's the tours section. So there are lots of tours already created by folks and you, know, you can publish your own. That's kind of my message. And then anything that's of a, I think it's less than a few hundred megabytes you can upload to Poly if it's a 3D model. So you can host non VR created items in here as well. I always say to folks, it's like YouTube, but for 3D content, like Sketchfab is. Um, however, it's integrated with Tilt Brush and Poly now. So if we all have Google accounts, thanks to the relationship between IU and Google. So you can make a Poly account using that IU username and um, work in Tilt Brush and then upload right up, to, right up to Poly. And then with your students, Margaret, they could actually, so they could do designs in, in blocks or Tilt Brush and then you could actually pull them down into VR and see them in VR right away without having to go into Unity. So something to think about it maybe. Okay, any other questions? All right. Well, this talk. Oh, who does? Oh, Maggie, yeah, yeah. Right, right. So. Uh, Maggie's group, uh, e-learning, they of course are interested in VR, right? Because they're, they're folks that they're serving are, aren't here. And I don't want to speak too much for them, but they have a relationship with Google that we've sort of, uh, uh, jumped in with them on and they have access to some, some technologies like the jump camera, which is a really high quality VR camera that I didn't highlight in my slides. I'll just bring up here. And I'm not saying that people should go out and buy one of these, but, it is interesting to see a very high resolution uh, 
360 video camera that's stereoscopic. The footage from this is excellent in a VR headset and without a VR headset. The only problem is you're usually streaming it down from YouTube servers. So the video is going to be uh, between 4K and 8K. And I think the like Insta360 Pro has a version that's come out that's 11K. And we're getting to that same old problem we've had with video resolution, which is the codecs can't keep up, the software part of it can't keep up, and then the hosting platforms can't keep up with that much resolution. But at least you could generate the file if you really, really wanted to get to that level of quality. All right, and if anybody's interested, I, I'm, I built this talk to grow. Like I built this talk as the first version of the talk. And as we fill out this, uh, this survey of all the different domains at, at IU across the different schools, and match them with what we consider to be good VR applications, and maybe later on AR applications or, or, uh, or different tools that relate to how we support researchers in the AVL. Um, you know, I, I think that this talk will just kind of continue to grow in terms of, of examples. Yeah. I try not to step on Tassie's toes with that actually, but I can show it if, if you don't mind. Okay. Yeah, I saw that, yeah. I, no, he's kidding. I, I showed a video that Jeff's going to show in his, his new talk. He's getting ready. So. On a Vive. Uh, not to my knowledge, actually. Yeah, that's unfortunate. So we see this disconnect now with content, Steam VR content running on the reality stations, things that are hosted on the web, not really working into a vibe, um, not easily. At least I. I right. So there's like kind of hacky ways to get to it. Okay. No. Mute my mic here because there's some sound in this. We can see a mix of a background that is a 360 image that was taken with the Insta360 Pro. And then we're highlighting very specific things like the, the grain of limestone here. Um, Tassie and Matt Mercer had to study how this tour was conducted in, in real life and then adapt it for the limitations that Google Poly has. I didn't know it was even Yeah. So getting to this, I would recommend on a headset using like a cardboard or any other phone. Um, so looking on Google Poly for the IU Limestone tour and then getting a cardboard viewer to view it in your phone. So if you use it as a cardboard, you, uh, so you interact with the phone, like you have to take it out every time, like think about like. Yeah, that's a really good question, Andrew, Andreas, because this actually is interactive, right? It's, it's not just a passive 360 video. We can use a Raycast interface with a, uh, a Google Cardboard touch button. So like usually they have a little thing that you press and all this is a lever that actually capacitively touches the screen and activates the Raycast. So you can do it just by touching your screen. But what you do is you just point your head at one of these hotspots and then press the button and it'll just, it'll send a ray into the 3D space and activate the event and, and trigger the, the, the content. Am I missing something here? I did. Yeah, so they, they're able to embed traditional media, even audio in this in this tour. Man, wouldn't we love to have weather like that today? <laughs> okay. Let me turn my mic off for that.
not um let me repeat this for the audience online okay so andy asked andy asked if the spreadsheet that i showed here is available online anywhere and like i said it's somewhat of an ongoing exercise that we're going through and i can eventually make this available online um, as we fill it out and sort of satisfied with the results and the other thing is i'm not sure i'm representing every major here i'm sure that uh as i go along i might you know, show this around to some of my colleagues. Hey, you for, totally forgot, you know, this group. So uh, I don't want to seem like we're ignoring anybody, but it's, it is quite a quite an exercise because there's, like I said, 380 represented across these different schools. And then there are some like, it's really just not applicable for a lot of cases, like the School of Law. Maybe I'm just not in the know with their needs, but I couldn't really find a lot of applications that would fit in. Maybe criminal justice and forensics. There is a forensics, um, which I'm not even sure if that's part of the school law. Um, there is a new forensics VR app coming out. I should highlight this real quick. It's not out, that's why it's not in my talk, but it's it's on Steam's store. It's like an early, like they're gonna release it. It's called uh, Crime Scene Reconstruction. By the way, um, if people go to Steam and go under games and just click virtual reality. There's new stuff here every day. And this is what I mean when I say I can't keep up with what's coming out. So yeah, there's gonna be a ton of video games. If we go and search for crime scene, this was interesting because it's more didactic than it is just a video game. Like it actually kind of talks about the, the aspects of forensics. So this actually leads to the question we bring up to you. Have you come across games that would be applicable for education? Have you found any that are meant to be games, but actually could serve as a education yeah. experience? Well, I mean, we'll get the question. yeah, so the question Bill asked was, are there games out there that have applicability in the classroom? And I guess this is what I mean by interplay, interplay between mm -hmm. games and education, because it wasn't built for education. A good example might be, uh, well, job simulator is actually a good example. <laughs> oh, yeah, there we go. There's a good example. Beer yeah. No, just kidding. No. Job simulator has all these amazing little interactive designs, like, like just clever toys, I would call them. So, like, if you're a student studying, say, like, human-computer interaction, you're going to glean some information from just studying how the interface is designed on that. Because, because they, they thought, thought through. through. I'll, I'll, I'll I'll labs made that, and they, they kind of thought through what people might do because you're stuck in a cubicle how can you make that fun and that's what they tasked themselves with and they made it into a fun fun game so that's one example i would say and then you know the broad reaching ones are of course google earth and youtube vr but like like we've kind of talked about you know youtube vr isn't really vr it's just 360 immersive media um let's see why is it there it is yeah so this is actually pretty impressive to me that they have this coming out, but it's not, not available yet. Yeah. Music. So you can see what they're thinking here, you know, it's sort of after a crime scene. And that looks pretty fun. Yeah. It's not like you're killing zombies or anything. It's like you're looking at an actual crime scene. Drugs, infrared evidence, blood splatter. So this is what we want to see more of. And this is why you know, I want to keep doing this talk a few times in a row. And hopefully we find some really immaculate uh, resources that kind of maybe span an entire school. I don't know. School music would be a nice one, right? To have more applications for music. Um, that reminds me to listen to hear what Maggie said. Uh,
So as Maggie said, we're using Tour Creator to make uh, pre-lab tours for each various teaching labs. So students know, uh, come in knowing where stuff is, and we can augment them with photos and explanations of different types of equipment. If we put videos in Tour Creator, if we could put tour videos in Tour Creator, we would um, have an awesome package. Yeah, so um, Maggie did show me some work they're doing with the Matterport as well. So the Matterport is another system that our lab offers that can 3D scan interior designs and uh, to help students off campus know what the MAC Assistance Center is, which is the Math Assistance Center, M-A-C, MAC. Um, they scan the Matterport and in, in, scan, scan that in, in 3D space, which I'll show. With the Matterport camera system. And, and students off campus, campus before, before they even come here and uh, let's see, let's see this. This can also be viewed. In a Google this cardboard. can also be viewed in a Google Cardboard. So, so it's, it's a, a typical, typical classroom, but there also is another one that they scanned, and it's it's juxtaposed with 3D data and. Uh, 360 photos. So we, we're looking at the 3D data now, and if I click, like, go down to kind of the Google Earth view, and I can click through 360 photos through the space. Let's see if I can find their other one real quick. Matterport will find it. You should like to have tours of labs on campus that they have. Which one? Oh, yes. So this is quite a large, large area here at IUPUI. Somebody uh, wrote something funny on one of the tables, too, because they knew it was going to be scanned uh, to get close to it. Is this, a, is this enough work in the finite section? Probably. <laughs> so a range of, you know, maybe not necessarily all VR. Maybe this talk should be titled, it's like a uh, survey of 3D tools per se, but then it gets actually really broad. But, uh, you know, VR has sort of interplay with a lot of these. Like I said, you can use a Google Cardboard to view this. And then uh, Eric mentioned that there was another scan on here. I'll show you. So that those are classrooms. That's one use. And then another use would be historical spaces. So so this was kind of a cool opportunity on a, on a Saturday. I went with... Uh, an informatics professor at the Medical History Museum, and we scanned two of the laboratories. So this place looks like it was boarded up in like the in the 1880s, and all of the equipment's still there. And uh, we were able to kind of scan this place. They were they were very thankful to do this because the building is sort of falling apart. You can kind of see over here. And if you've ever seen uh, the movie Young Frankenstein, they have a room like in the beginning of that movie over here, which I wish we could have scanned. That's like an old school lecture hall. So like where they might have done like autopsies back in the 1800s. I'm not sure I would ever want to be in those classes. Yeah, and I think that the the taking the principal home under and getting started, but let's say you're going to do a virtual tour because you, I don't know, 
you work on a campus that does tours all the time. Right? Like the like AVL, we do tours all the time, time for our lab. It's like, it's, it's probably, probably a good idea, idea for us to get started in the process of making a virtual tour with what's available. Because as, you know, the hosting platforms get better and the limitations sort of fall down, um, we can always revisit the exercise and, and sort of refine our tactics. And it's just going to get better and better as the cameras get better, as the recording devices get better. One of the really neat things Google has done is um, said that Google Poly will probably host light fields later on. And they have a Steam app right now that they show what they call light fields. And there's still a little bit of debate in the community um, about it, if this is truly a light field. But I don't really care that much about it. It is a very high quality rendering from a camera system, recording system. It's nice and uh, stereoscopic, but also, also very uh, accommodating as far as what, what the real world looks like. Oh, come on. There's the steam burner. This is also free. And you can get a, get a hold of this on any of these rally stations in here. I'm not sure what's up with my instance of the Steam website. doesn't seem to want to take my click. There it goes. Ministry officials say they're I they would add a video on here. So what's nice about it, though, is um, they've captured some of these scenes where you have, like, nice lighting coming in from windows and reflective surfaces. And as you kind of pivot your weight on, on your feet, you'll notice that the reflections actually work properly. The lighting does change a little bit. And there's a stereoscopic parallax that happens with the edge of the sink. So it looks pretty close to reality, depending on the headset you're looking through. And, you know, if they're making big, fancy, expensive cameras that do light field and all the software to package the data, you know, that just interplays in my mind with what they already do with consumers, which is just they go from these advanced concepts down to like hardware solutions that we can maybe buy off the shelf at Best Buy and go out and capture this type of content. So yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, the next generation of immersive media recording. <laughs> I even had a student last time in my class talk about security systems, you know, immersive recording security systems. Never thought of that. You know, I'm sure people are trying that. He, I think he's in the military. He's thinking along those lines. All right. Well, it is short, the talk is actually pretty short as I was putting it together. But like I said, I think it's going to grow in the future when I redo this and, and survey more. But uh, I think I'll stop there unless there's there's uh, talk in the chat. Nope. Okay. Well, thanks for everybody for coming today and on, on Zoom and in person. Thank you very much. Good to see a lot of you. I haven't, like my gene, I seen, haven't seen you since last year. That's a good question. So the question was, is there a tour that creates, if there's anybody else on listening online, if creates the tour for the inside of the computer, like the von Neumann architecture, for instance, right? So like if I wanted to show how that's all constructed, I haven't ever seen anything like that, but I mean, this to me seems like something that could be made in Google Blocks, right? Because that's uh, something you might spend an hour or two in just like, okay, this is a RAM stick, this is a motherboard, and you just draw it up as you know, cu cubic shapes and colors and then putting ta text tags on them. And you could put that right up on Poly and then it could be viewed by students right away. So there's a lot of creativity I think you have to come with right now. <laughs> As you can see from my list, there's a lot of empty squares, of especially law and business. Oh, yeah. Not going to be something for everybody quite yet. Yeah, I've heard of this. Yeah, I don't know much about it. it kind of expensive. So uh, the question was, have I heard of the, the, the hi red hydrogen phone, which is like made by the company that makes the red camera? Um, do you know much more about it? I'll look it up here. It's, it is pretty amazing. So it has a stereoscopic screen, right? You have seen it? <laughs> 
business operates. The commission is acting That's on quite the phone. Facebook and Amazon will dominate markets by affording huge amounts of customer data. The commission opened a website on Wednesday to gather information from client firms. Of the oh, wow. It gives you like parallax just from a regular snap. Wow. With Japanese IT giants, such as you got it. Yep. Yeah, that's their logo there. The commission will use this information along with surveys sent to companies to check for problems. Thirteen hundred dollars. Discrimination, contracts, inappropriate handling of personal data. The IP firms could be questioned in cases just. Getting text messages to make sure that's not Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> I think it does. On IT businesses. Yeah, there. When I was at. I, w I got a chance to go to Red and like like look around when the Cuban Center went there. Um, they just took me along. It was really cool. But uh, they were working with Next VR at the time. So then let me see if I can find a picture of their rig. So this is what they use for like live streaming an NBA game to uh, Oculus Go. Francis is known for a strong wish to see nuclear weapons abolished. Last month, he reportedly indicated his folks to visit Tokyo and the city's hit by a car yeah. World War II, Hiroshima and oh, the snap-on accessories for those pinouts on the back. Yeah, I don't know. Red cameras, I know, are very modular. I don't know what else you would attach to it, but I can imagine, right? Because an iPhone can have a FLIR attachment that can do thermal imaging now. You could probably just keep adding bells and whistles. Oh, like desktop Unity games? Cool. <laughs> Oh, okay, okay. So the so then when you're looking through one of these viewfinders, it's stereoscopic. Yeah, this is the one for next VR here. So like smaller rig. And then at Oculus Connect, that's a conference that I'd encourage anybody to go to if you want to. It's in LA, usually in September. Um, and it's it's an industry event. It's just like very entertainment focused, but um, you'll see these all this stuff set up, you know, like kind of the, the consumer facing uh, solutions. And uh, they did the keynotes all done live streamed in VR. I mean, yawn, right? You're going to put on a VR headset and watch it lecture. But <laughs> I think they also did, I told Eric, he was, we were laughing because they did the political debates with next VR red cameras. Too. It's like, how boring to be in VR and just watch like politics. You know? so, but you know, for a global international studies, maybe that's, that's useful. I also believe that there's like compression and playback techniques that don't necessarily have to be just raw video frames coming in and texturing 3D objects. That's what we get right now. We have a sphere around us and we're texturing 4K, 8K, 11K on this sphere or a cube. And like that only can go so far until like the foundries have to keep making chips that just get bigger and bigger. So like there are software solutions like what Otoy is wanting to do with Facebook here where they're using depth maps. And uh, this is kind of coming more soon, I guess. I, where um, I'm going to turn my mic off. And it's pledged to hold an election to hand over power to a civilian administration, but it's repeatedly postponed that. Protests against the delays have spread this month after the government pushed back the date it had set for February. It claims the launch of a new government could clash with preparations for the king's right? upcoming coronation. Yes. Even with the date finalized, there are mounting doubts whether Thailand will return to a democratic path. The military effectively appoints all members of the upper house, a third of all lawmakers. Pro-military political parties have been launched to secure seats in the lower house. And the prime minister and former army chief, Prayut Chan-o-cha, has hinted he'll continue to lead the country. 
Shout Thai hip hop. Well, once right, much imitating much. Western culture and fashion, but one teenager is using rap to highlight the situation in the nation's biggest slum in his own words. And it's here for Papaya Kanaldum reports. <laughs> Candeo VR. So let me see if I can find that, that video. So for the folks in Zoom, we're chatting about um, different techniques in terms of recording immersive media and different things that come with the red hydrogen camera. I might be behind what you guys are talking about. Uh, and Jeff actually showed me this. K-A-N-D-A-O. Yeah. Yeah, I may not be able to find the specific video, but uh, let me see if, because it was for a contest. They have a higher end version as well. Yeah, $7,000 for their higher end one, the Obsidian. <laughs> if they're still in business. <laughs> yeah, that website doesn't work. There we go. So they have two products, and then both of them can do a range of outputs that include monoscopic, stereoscopic, I'm talking images and video, and depth mapping uh, for the video. And their solution, I sent a video to the team, the ABL team a little while back where they were reviewing footage from these cameras and it was like really bizarre if you went and moved side to side because like if a branch came at you and you shot that, the depth map might actually perceive it to be that close and you would have like polygons coming right at your face that would be textured with the branch but then if you looked around it, it would just look like this blob, like cone coming at you. So it's not the best uh, technique to, um, to do this but I'm, I'm happy to see the evolution of it because the next step is once somebody solves it. No, I'm, I'm, I'm on. Yeah. So the next step though is in, if you, once you get some sort of like, you know, spatialized capture from one point that works pretty well for side to side is then to synchronize another one and another one like we would do with the Matterport, right? So yeah, spatialized capture. The, uh, the free D system over in uh, assembly hall is a photogrammetry system. And that's, you know, that's really an amazing spatial capture system. So uh, I like to bring this up for folks too, because we, it is, it's kind of underestimated. We have like one of the biggest photogrammetry systems <laughs> available and it's just, it's over here in our uh, assembly hall. 
That's right. Yeah. 28 cameras mounted up um, in the ceiling. And then the data looks uh, sort of like this here, kind of blocky of the players. So just polygons with texture map on top. And they cut out the floor. And they've got a cluster in the basement that's dedicated to processing the, the footage. And at any given frame, you just take all 28 perspectives, photogrammetrize those, and then you end up with the replay interface. And they swing the camera around and look at a specific area. And that's the whole purpose of it. It'd be nice if I showed you some examples. It took the decision after finally obtaining all data from a Moscow laboratory involved in widespread doping cover-ups. A while back, the reason I bring this up is a while back, um, there was a, uh, a choreographer named, famous choreographer named Twyla Tharp, who's friends with Mick Robbie, and she uh, was wanting to work with some IU folks, and they were coming up with ideas for what she might do with technology with her choreography, and then, one of the things I threw out was, well, why don't you just take the dance to assembly hall and then you could do this type of processing on it. And then that's, I don't know where that's gone from here on out. And they were sort of a, another group was kind of handling that project. But this, this is exactly what I think what you can do because IU licenses dances, right? It's so like if we have a ballet come to town or like I helped Margaret several years ago uh, with a, a play at Buzzkirk Chumley. And she, did you guys have to license to, to do that? And you only had a certain range of time to show it? Do you remember? Because sometimes it's like an intellectual property to show a production, right? Um, and some, and it, it can only be here for a certain amount of time. So it'd be nice to 3D capture it is what I'm getting at. Some people in Japan's Northeast are feeling nostalgic about a particular type of signal. Okay. It's all you, right? Yeah, so I've heard from some of the music faculty that they'll, they'll be able to do a, a a concert piece but they're only allowed a range to do it in and it's like it would be it would be so awesome to capture that spatially so we at least have it as data and then IU has um, the MDPI project which is all about uh, digitizing traditional media that we've had and it's been a lot of film and photos and all other types of audio recordings but 3d collections could also be digitized as well so it's just something that's on our minds for sure and uh, that's not just static objects. What if you could record performances? So I better conclude because I could talk about this kind of stuff for, for days <laughs> I'm after 5.15. So thanks, everybody.